Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. Please leave a review if you haven't done so already. We sincerely appreciate it. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Please show your support for this podcast and give it life by making a donation to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate or pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. You can also find our app in our Apple App Store called Big Buck Deer Hunter 2015 and in the Google Play Store for Google and Android devices. Thanks for your support and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 121. Steph Brown, the Ohio Huntress, hunting the big deer in Ohio versus hunting the big game in Africa. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Jean McFall, a finalist of Extreme Huntress from Boise, Idaho. You are about to listen to one of my favorite hunting podcasts of all time, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Skip Peterson from Deerhead Archery. Gear up for another amazing podcast with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey everybody, this is Stephen Fuller from The Hunting Ground. You are listening to my favorite podcast on the internet. To the Big Buck Registry, it's the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, what's happening? It's Jay Scott from the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm hanging out with you right now as you're listening to this show. There's no place I'd rather be. And there's a friend of mine over there in Ohio who is also mic'd up right now who I'm sure feels the same way. Hey, you know something, Jay? I do feel the same way and I also feel that now is the time to break out your Northwoods common sense deer attractant. Get some of that buck with torso on the mox grace. Holy cow, watch out. It's that time of season. It is that time of the season for sure. Uh, Dean Vanier, of course, uh, we did a couple of really good shows, actually. The, we called it Common Sense, or uh, basically understanding how to use all these deer urines that are out there. Soup to nuts. So if you ever want to check that out, uh, go to episode, let me see. You can go to episode 071. That was uh, Deer P202. And he was also on a year prior which was episode number 18, Common Sense Deer Lures 101 with Dean Vanier Northwoods Common Sense. So check that out. It's a great recap. We'll actually post a couple things on Facebook to get you links back to those exact shows. So check us out on Facebook if you want so you can get direct links to listen to everything you ever wanted to know about Deer Pee. Everything you ever want to know about Deer Pee. Now, speaking of Dean Vanier, I understand he's in your neck of the woods as we are talking right now. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's in Ohio and he's on a big whitetail hunt, uh, and, and, uh, best of luck to Dean and his wife. Yes, absolutely. And we, we've actually, uh, been getting some reports that people are listening to the podcast and actually buying the product because they listen to the podcast. So we, uh, we certainly wish them good luck as well for using that product. Well, this week, uh, Dusty, we we're actually, uh, we're staying in Ohio, believe it or not in a sense, because we're talking to a gal who is known as the Ohio Huntress, Steph Brown. Kind of a very a very interesting gal because she's she's in the Ohio area, but we're going to sh- talk about the contrast of hunting Africa versus hunting Ohio. Yeah, it's going to be a real cool experience, you know. It's uh, definitely a major difference going from Ohio to Africa. But, uh, man, it's something that, uh, you know, we kind of look forward to, Jay, because uh, it's out of our box a little bit. It is. It's kind of neat because you're going to hear about deer hunting in Ohio from the perspective of Steph Brown. And you're going to see her perspective of 
uh, what it's like to hunt in Africa because she did go on a trip recently with our good friend Matt Hyatt. So and she's a very well rounded hunter. I mean, let's uh, let's give her some props there. She she kind of knows what she's doing. Yeah, it's always great to hear from a female hunter that's uh, got a little bit of experience and some time in the woods under her belt. And uh, you know, who knows? It may take your hunt to the next level. Undoubtedly. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's go get Steph Brown. Let's do it. Steph Brown, welcome to the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening, Steph? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, we're you're very welcome to, to be here. We've uh, heard good things about you from our good buddy, Matt well, Hyatt. thank you. Yes, we hear you. Yes, Matt is one of my best friends. We, we hear you're a, a just a, a, a hunter. Of, of the highest caliber and uh that's what we like that these are the types of people we like to talk to on this show people that can get it done in the field and have a strategy and we hear you fit that bill well thank you very much that's a big compliment especially coming from matt i think a lot of him too so steph tell us about yourself where are you from well i uh, grew up in a small town called waynesville ohio it's in the southwest region of ohio and i was born and raised here and still live in the area not in waynesville currently but i've um i've moved across the country a couple times lived out west and uh keep finding myself back here and this is the place i call home interesting so you ohio was what kind of where you grew up and then you traveled and 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 looked at other spots of the country and then came back is that correct yeah. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So what dro- what draws you back to Ohio? Uh, really family and, you know, just being able to be around my dad and my brother and, um, you know, they're one of my favorite hunting partners. So I love coming back and, you know, I miss, I miss being away from home. So that's really what brought me back. Gotcha. Something special about Ohio. Dusty, would you attest to that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, obviously home of uh, giant whitetails for one. And, you know, for the most part, there's good people here. Absolutely. So, Steph, you uh, you attended high school uh, in Ohio, I take it? Yes, I did. So what were you like in high school? Um, I was a little bit of a wild child. Um, <laughs> not going to lie about that, but All right. I was an athlete. I played a lot of sports. Um, pretty outdoorsy my whole life. That's just. Okay. How I was raised. But. Gotcha. So when did when did hunting become part of your life? I can tell from your Facebook profile and everything we've heard about you that hunting is very much a part of your life. But that has to be introduced at some point. When when was that for you? Um, well, hunting really was introduced to me um, at birth. <laughs> um, my dad bought a, a large uh, parcel of land down in southeastern Ohio in the mid 1970s and he started building a cabin you know years after when i was born and we spent every weekend there you know i'd get out of school on a friday we'd cruise down to the cabin we'd stay there all weekend and that was pretty much my life through the fall any hunting season we were there and you know i'd get up early on monday mornings and my mom would drive us hour hour and a half back to school in rainsville and um, you know so i've been around it my whole life really Gotcha. So it's just kind of always been in the background, something almost like you wouldn't necessarily think of it uh, not being there. It's just kind of always been there. Does that, does that sound Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. It's always been there. It wasn't always a passion of mine. I mean, it's always something I enjoyed. Maybe, um, you know, I'd just been around it so long that it was just second nature to me. Um, it wasn't always something that I thought I was going to be doing so intensely and you know, live, eat, and breathe hunting, but now that's just the way of life. Gotcha. So let's talk about your, like your hunting philosophies. I mean, if it's been part of your life, what what types of things do you think about when you're hunting? Like, let's just talk about deer hunting. Like, what what drives you to get out of the bed in the morning to go? Oh, it's, that's a great question because you know, it's like when you have to get up for work and right. the alarm's going off and you can just sit there and hit snooze and snooze and snooze. When it comes hunting season, it's the exact opposite. The alarm goes off once, you jump out of bed. It's just this drive, this passion, something that you're born with, I think, or that's just instilled into you once you catch that fever. It really is. It's like a it's like a disease. <laughs> um, you know, it's just something that controls you and something that you just eat, sleep and breathe. You I dream about I dream about deer hunting. I actually had a dream about it the other night and that's when you really know it's 
it's just ingrained in your brain. Yeah. And I really have no other way to describe it other than that. Yeah, we had the opening day of, of duck season here the other day, and I I set my alarm for 5 o'clock, and I wanted to be there at the spot by, I think it was uh, 5.45, and that was going to give me just enough time to do all that. And 4.30 rolls around, my eyes open, and I'm just staring at the ceiling, and I've got a, a, another hour or another four, half an hour before my alarm goes off. And that's what it's like. I just knew it was duck season and it's time to go. And I couldn't wait. It was just, it's one of those things. It definitely is. I totally agree. So let's talk about some of your, your, your philosophy about what hunting is and, and how do you go about it? What, what types of rules do you employ for yourself when you're hunting? Well, that's another great question. Um, really say I have a philosophy about about how I go about hunting, but I do try to, you know, play the wind. But, you know, I prepare, you know, right after right after winter. And as soon as hunting season's over, as far as whitetail is concerned, I really start concentrating on turkeys. And then as soon as that is as soon as that season ends, then I feel like I'm right back into whitetail, setting up cameras, you know, um, we are allowed to, to bait here in Ohio, so you set up food sources. Um, not really big on food plots. I've never hunted over food plots. More um, free range whitetail hunting. Um, we have large large area down in southeast Ohio that we hunt. It's all private land, um, mainly cattle land. So you really hunt the cattle down there and can't really worry too much about food plots. I haven't been much of a trophy hunter, um, but I will say that you know I've through years and learning through friends and family and different things, I've been able to pattern some of the bigger deer. And you know, once you get to a certain point, I guess, especially with hunting big bucks, you want to keep surpassing what you've already shot the year before or the year before that. So really just the patterning and playing the wind and, um, you know, like I said, setting up trail cameras and things like that, that all helps play into really getting some of those big boys and you may get lucky without them but for the most part i think the way the majority of the people hunt these days they're all pretty much doing the same thing same practices okay gotcha let's uh i'd like to go through a little uh, gear check with you kind of see what you what tools you use to be successful in the field dust you want to take this one yeah absolutely let's get a little bit about uh your setup and, and we're going to go into the woods here in ohio tell us what kind of tree stands you're using stuff um, I use an advanced kickdown tree stand, a hang-on stand. In the past, I've used um, ladder stands. That's pretty much the only kind of stand I was using at some point. But the uh, hang-on stands are a lot easier to move around. And the um, advanced kickdown tree stands I found to be one of the one of the best on the market. Um, they have a built-in ratchet system. They're easy to install. Um, they feel secure to me. Safety is really important when you're 20 feet up in the tree. Um, obviously, wearing a harness and, and all of that's very, very important. You hear a lot of stories about people having incidents in the tree stand, and um, that's just something something that I thought about as I started to uh, get away from the ladder stand. Um, just the real overall safety and making sure that you have good equipment. I mean, that's one of the biggest things for me is good equipment and I feel the advanced takedown tree stands are they're really up to par when it comes to just durability and safety. Right, absolutely. What kind of safety harness are you using? I use a muddy combo harness. Okay. Awesome. So let's get in a little bit about your trail cam setup. What kind of trail cameras are you using? I use the uh, Primos um eight megapixel camera. Um there's several different models, but they to me I've used those and I've also used log game innovation cameras as well, which I've had I've had great great luck with both of those cameras. To be quite honest, I've several I've had for many, many years, still working, still produce great great quality pictures and kind of just the ones I stick with. I know I know they work. All right, absolutely. How long have you been running Primos cameras? I've been running the Primos cameras now for the last two years. Those were um, those were one of my most, I would say, more recent purchases, I guess, when it comes to the game cameras. And I was really impressed with them. And the uh, battery life is what impressed me the most. Gotcha. I have, I've been, you know, I'll run one of those for five or six months um, on a single set of batteries. How, how many pictures do you think you're taking over that five or six months? Oh, I might have to 
kill you if I tell you that. But um, several hundred a week just depends on the area they set them up in. Gotcha. So you're looking at roughly a thousand pitchers a month. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Just curious to see how many uh, snaps that camera's taken over the last two years. And how long you been running wild game innovation cameras? Uh, we've been using wild game innovation cameras um, probably the last decade or so. No kidding. And the majority of the cameras that we've owned are used on our farm. So what what uh, made you choose those particular cameras, the Wild Game Innovation, over others? Well, the Wild Game Innovation cameras, um, my dad always used them, and I think that's just what I started to use because I had followed in his footsteps. Whatever he was using, I was using. And then as I got into it and got more interested in having more cameras and setting them up in other places and, you know, acquired some of my own uh, private lands to hunt, I started purchasing, you know, cameras on my own then. And I just kind of stepped outside the box, wanted to see what else was out there, kind of compare. You know, I've seen great, I've seen great pictures from a lot of different people and have been impressed with the photos that I've seen and wanted to test out some new equipment. Yeah, I think absolutely. We all like to find the time, see what That's all's right. on the market. There's a, there's definitely a lot of competition out there when it comes to hunting equipment. So, you know, yeah, testing sure. them all and which ones you like the best and that's really what it came down to. Right. And a lot of times family tradition goes a long way in what you purchase and what you use. Absolutely. So let's get into a little bit about your your hunting gear, your actual attire. What what kind of camo are you using these days? Honestly, I stick mainly with a real tree camo pattern. That's just um, something I've always done. I'm a big field and stream fan. Um, I have a lot of their uh, their C3, um, so it's their cover scent clothing, and um, I've had they're just really comfortable. From a woman's standpoint, it's really hard to find good fitting camo for women. A lot of the camo clothing um, doesn't necessarily fit the best for women, but theirs I found is uh, is very is very fitting for the just for the women in general. Um, and that's kind of what I've stuck with. Gotcha, I mean, I've yeah. tried everything. Yeah. So you're saying Field and Stream has a little bit more comfort for a women's apparel? They do. They carry a pretty large line of of women's apparel for hunting and it gives you a lot of options but their their c3 technology real tree pattern clothing is probably the the best that i've found um that and i've also uh purchased through field and stream as well as their under armor some of their under armor line um, which i i like that that's more of my early season clothing that I wear is the Under Armour, the so lighter weight clothing. Well, that's interesting that Field and Stream has some apparel that, uh, you know, that's more preferred by uh, a lady hunter. That's uh, good information to pass along to, to a female listener for sure. Absolutely. So you, yeah, you're wearing... I've had great luck there. I really have with with clothing. I mean, I've, I've bought clothing from Bass Pro, from Cabela's, and I definitely feel like Field and Stream has um, a larger array of um, a lineup, I guess I should say, for the women hunters. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, great information to pass along. If you're a lady hunter, check out Field and Stream. They might just have something that uh, suits you a little better than others. What Do you do anything for scent control as far as soaps and, and you know, pre-hunt preparation? I do. I'm kind of big on that. I I definitely, like I said earlier, I believe on playing the wind. and Walk us um, through what you, know, you do like, as far as preparation. Um, going into it at least, you know, a couple of days beforehand, I like to try to wash anything that I'm going to wear. Face mask, undershirts, you know, jackets, pants, anything that I can throw in the washing machine. I wash it um, in an unscented, in an unscented wash and then I'll actually use you know the fabric fabric sheets or anything that I can that's a scent control um, I use uh, bust a buck beer lore has a line of cover scent products that I use called with the uh, fresh earth scent that's pretty popular these days is the fresh earth but um, I use that to wash all my clothes dry my clothes with them and then they have a fresh earth Spray, and I will take my clothes basically from the dryer straight outside, hang them up, spray them down, and leave them out until I get ready to get in my truck. So just before I get in my truck, I'll gear up in the garage with, you know, 
all my clothes and that way they're not inside catching scents from any food or, you know, candles or anything that I might be burning in the house. So not right. saying I'm burning food, but candles. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts about from the time you put your, your gear on and get in the truck? Are you afraid at all that you're going to pick up any kind of odd scent in your vehicle headed out to the woods? Oh, yeah, I do. Actually, I, I ride with the windows down in my truck. And then mm-hmm. when I get to the farm or wherever it is that I'm going, I'll get back out and I'll spray back down again. I spray my backpack. I spray everything. I mean, I'll go as far as spraying my bow. I mean, Anything that I can get sent off of or, you know, repel the scent, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to take every precaution because you never know when the wind might start swirling and you just want to be ready. And right. I'd hate to go through all of that, you know, all of that time and effort and be getting scent free only to get in my truck and feel like, hey, now I smell like everything that's in here again or, or whatnot. So when I get to that final destination time to spray down again once i get outside right makes sense i also i also use their they have a lotion line um through bust a buck deer lord and they have a fresh earth lotion and i will lather up and that smells just like dirt i love it it's actually one of my favorite smells but it really sticks with you and it i when i can smell that dirt i, I it gives me a sense of um security <laughs> That's what I'll call it. Sense of security. Oh, okay. like dirt. I know. Kind of makes sense. I really, I really like it. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Do you? Uh, let's get into a little bit about your bow setup. Tell us what kind of bow you're shooting. Um, I've been shooting a Hoyt Vixen, um, 2014 model that I bought at um, the beginning of 2014. I actually bought it in January of 2014, and um, it's uh, right now I shoot it at 50. 50 pounds. Um, that's, that's pretty much what I've been shooting all my bows out for the last several years. Um, I shot a bear bow before that. Um, both bows are really fast. It's kind of like how I like my setup. I like a fast shooting bow, and um, you know, I try to try to stay in shape as much as I can so I can shoot at 50 pounds or higher. I feel a lot more secure in shooting large game with a bow with that type of setup. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great bows out there now. I, I mean, I've shot several of them. I shot several at ATA last year. And, you know, I think there's a lot of competition in the bow market now. And, you know, you can say, I'm a Hoyt person, I'm a Matthews person. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to what bow feels right for you. Um, I, sh- I shot a Tribe archery bow a couple weeks ago. Um, went out and met Heath Painter, and he's... Um, you know, done a lot of things with Tribe, and they're really working on their compound bows. And I shot a few of his, and I was really impressed with them. I mean, they're fast shooting bows, so I'm not one that's a big bow brand type of person. I'm not stuck on one brand or the other. Um, so I, you know, I could make that switch over to Tribe. We'll see. Um, but right now, that's that's what I've been shooting the last um, the last almost two years is the Hoyt Vixen. Gotcha. Ampatech, are, are you shooting carbon arrows through that? I am. I've been shooting um, Black Eagle, um, the Outlaws are the gotcha. are the arrows that I've been shooting. Um, in the past, I've I've shot I've shot the um, Gold Tip XTs and I've shot some Eastern arrows. So I've been really impressed with the Black Eagles. I definitely don't see myself straying from their lineup anytime soon. I've had you know several kills with them now and i'm just a i'm a big fan of them they're really good solid arrows gotcha for sure what kind of broadhead are you tipping it with a montec g5 you know three blade broadhead gotcha and how long have you been shooting g5s i'm actually I switched over to those this year and um i've been really impressed with them i was shooting quick tricks before that and i you know i really like those as well just like kind of going back to some of the other equipment you want to see what else is out there on the market I've um, tried some mechanical broadheads and not really a big fan of mechanicals. I just don't have the faith in them that I do with some of the fixed blade broadheads. But kind of what made me step outside the box and um, going back to uh, the Africa trip, that was actually something that was suggested was either a two or three blade broadhead. So it got me thinking, like, if they have that much confidence in two and three blade broadheads, why don't I try shooting white tail with them? So I, um, I actually 
shot a eight point buck a couple of weeks ago down in Paducah, Kentucky, using the Montec T5, and it was a it was a really great experience for me, and I was very impressed with the broadhead. Right, and on that, I think the broadhead that I shot the buck with is still sharp enough that I could probably go out and whack another one with it. I no mean, kidding. I'm not that broadhead, yeah. Wow. And that Impressive. buck was with a uh, previous guest of ours, Allison Roberts. Yes, Allison Roberts. She's my soul sister, one of my best friends. Very cool. And that was a really, really fun experience, getting to shoot with um, with another female hunter who's just as passionate about hunting as you know as you are you don't find uh you don't find too many women um in this you know in this industry or really that are close to home seem to be fewer and far between but i mean there's definitely women out there that enjoy hunting might like to go out with their significant others but ones that like to do it on their own the same way you do and really like to pattern deer and you know get cameras out and and feed and stuff through the you know your summer's consumed with white tail on the brain until the fall rolls around she's definitely one of those ladies and we that's how we bonded very cool yeah good deal well we've covered your setup your tree stands and, and we got into a little bit about your bow Jay, let's get into a hunting story. Yeah, let's get into a hunting story. One of the things I want to ask you, Steph, before we get into that, though, um, let's talk about the, the practicality of, of places to hunt. What you, how do you go about deciding it's a good place to hunt? And once you find a place, how do you go about getting permission to hunt on the land if it's not yours? And do you, do you tend to go back to the same hunting spots over and over? Well, over the last several years, I feel very fortunate. You know, we have a, a farm in in Southeast Ohio that I hunted a lot. Uh, but my dad, growing up, was a farmer, and therefore he knows a lot of the farmers around, which has came in handy in a lot of cases, um, you know, just getting in front of those farmers. And if they're not hunters themselves and don't mind you being on their land, I mean, the worst thing you're going to get out of them is a no if you go and ask for permission. If you know someone that doesn't hunt and you think that they've let you on their land, go ask. I mean, we'll think it's for the worst thing they're going to say is no. Maybe kick you off their property. I don't know. But you just got to get out there now. Um, for me, I've hunted mainly private land since, um, you know, since the beginning of time. But um, in the last couple of years, I've found a few spots. That, you know, people that I didn't really know and maybe kind of had an in through a friend of a friend type of situation. And, you know, I've just straight up asked them, like, I know that looks like a great piece of property. You know, hey, do you think they'd let me hunt out there? You know, well, I don't see why not. So, you know, put a, put a word in for me. How can I get in touch with them and just go out and put myself in front of those people and, you know, and just get their permission. Some people have said no. You know, some people already have people that are hunting their land. And if not, you know, they've said yes. I've been fortunate enough to, you know, gain a couple extra pieces of property close to home that I can hunt. And, you know, um, being in Ohio, I mean, there are some great public land hunting. And really, I've never had to, I've never had to hunt public land um, in Ohio, but I know a lot of people that do and have been very successful with it. And, you know, if you're willing to, really get back in deep in the woods you know take a couple mile hike back there you're gonna you're gonna have success it's just about you said knowing you know the further you get back in there the the better your success rate is going to be it might be a a lot longer of a haul out but (laughs) it's definitely going to be worth it if you make the trek especially in southern ohio you really you really can't go wrong down here. I mean, there's not very many places that you can go if you don't know what you're doing or at least get some, you know, some know, some know-how from someone that lives in the area. Um, I think you can pretty much guarantee yourself success if you set yourself up correctly. Gotcha. So let's say you wanted to approach a landowner. How do you open up that conversation? What's the first thing you say? Hi, my name's Steph. How are you doing? All right. <laughs> That's really all it's going to go. I try to smile, um, okay. you know, be polite and, you know, really just get away on the charm a little bit with these farmers. You know, a lot of them are older or, you know, some of them are set in their ways. And you have to go in expecting to hear no. I mean, you really do. So if they say no, hey, they might have someone that's already hunting on the property. That person may not be around, you know, a year after, a year after that. I'd stay in their good graces and, you know, hey, if anything changes, let me know. Okay. So I would always go into it with a smile. That's that's good advice. 
Let's uh, let, yeah, let's get let's get into the hunting a little bit here, Steph. I want to hear about your your trip to Africa and with Matt Hyatt and how do you even start or begin to set that up? How do you how do you begin a, a hunt abroad? How do you do that? Oh gosh, oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, how that all started? Matt had actually purchased a hunt um, from Stanley Fakir Safaris in the Limpopo Valley in South Africa through a charity auction. Um, it was an auction that was benefiting a, a female friend of ours, another hunter who had breast cancer. And he had purchased this hunt package through them. And he said, hey, you know, we're going on this hunt. My wife and I, Rhonda, who both of them I actually went to high school with, and we were all really good friends. And I was just like, sure, you know, it sounds awesome. I had a passport, so check. You got to have a passport to get out of the country. That was already there. I'm like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to go on a hunt. And after looking into it and the, the prices of the packages and animals that you were offered and comparing that to some of the other hunts here in the state, um, going to Texas or even to Canada to hunt whitetail, it was just, it sounded like too good of a deal to pass out. So I was in from the beginning and we set this trip up about a year in advance. Um, I think we started our planning in August of uh, 2014. And then our our trip commenced the last week of July of this summer, so July 2015. So it was just under a year. And, um, you know, I, I think we had a countdown <laughs> about <laughs> every day on how close we were getting to this trip. But there was a lot yeah. of stuff that went into the preparation for it because, you know, the animals there are completely different. A lot of them you've never seen except for in a zoo. Um <laughs> Right. So I ordered a I ordered a shop placement guide offline. That took me actually a couple months to get. It was just a small book. Um, so if you are going to go overseas on a trip like that, I would definitely recommend getting a shop placement guide, studying the animals that you're going to be hunting, figure out where their kill zones are because it's totally different from you know from any of the animals you're going to shoot here. Um, shop placements are a little a little. Uh, farther forward on the animals, which I wouldn't have guessed. I would, you know, I think I would have gone into it assuming, you know, you're going to be looking for the same spot. Right. So that was a really good insight, um, just studying up on those animals. Um, you know, we looked a lot into the, into the cost. I called my taxidermist and said, hey, how much is it going to cost me to get these mounted when I come back? Because there's going to be more expenses involved after everything's said and done. And sure. I just wanted to be prepared for all of that. So I called my taxidermist. I spoke with the taxidermist in South Africa, compared the pricing to see, you know, what was going to be best for me. Should I get it done there? Should I get it done here? I got quotes on what it would cost just to have the animals dipped and shipped back from South Africa yep. to Ohio. And so I really had a good idea in whole of what the, you know, the total cost of the trip was, was going to take. And, you know, that way I was prepared and, um, you know, looked at airlines and, you know, different flights. And, and there was a lot of stuff that went into it. Gotcha. But a lot of it, you know, was that mental, I think, was more of the mental preparedness that you need to have for going over because you do invest so much into it physically, mentally. You know, on a financial level, you just want to make sure that you get the most out of everything that you put forth into that trip because it could be a once in a lifetime trip. Who's to say I'll ever go back? I don't know. I'd love to. I'd love to go back this summer if I could. That may not happen, but you know, one day when I do, I'll be prepared and I'll know what I'm, you know, I'll know what I'm looking forward to again and it'll be, you know, twice as fun, twice as easy. Okay. So how, what type of species are we talking about when you're hunting over there? Which ones did you hunt and which ones uh, did you hunt and were successful with? Well, initially the package that I bought included a gims buck, an impala, and a blue wildebeest. So there were three animals that were included in the package. It was like a set deal, you know, included my stay, my drinks, my food, plus those three plain game animals. And when I when I got to South Africa, you know, I'd never seen any of those animals in the wild. And you're not necessarily guaranteed that you're going to get a shot at any of those animals. You know, just in any other type of hunting, it's hunting, it's not called killing. Um, right. But I was able to get in front of some of those animals. And then at the same time, 
I'm seeing all these other animals, and I feel like a kid in a candy store because I'd never seen a bluff buck before. But then I saw a gims buck, and a gims buck is one of the animals that I that I had the uh, that had the opportunity um, to kill while I was there, and it was just an amazing creature. And when I saw it, I just knew in the bottom of my heart that that was one of the animals that I wanted to take on this trip. I wanted to bring one back home. And it was a mission from day two, I think it was, that I saw this animal. Okay. Um, I asked my guide, you know, what it was going to cost me to shoot that one. And um, that's pretty much, I was just dead set on on hunting this animal for the next couple of days. I totally forgot about the bluff buck I had in my package. Um, and I actually saw the gym buck while I was hunting for the Impala um, and saw several but no shooters. And then I was just asphyxiated on this gym buck. Okay. So that was one of the animals that I ended up taking. So how hard is it to to hunt a gems buck? I mean, what what type of strategies did they set you up with, and are, how much is your your knowledge versus following your guide's knowledge? You know, I didn't have any knowledge on the animal. I didn't even know what the animal was when I saw it on the trip. You know, that was part of the fun of it because I'd never seen half these animals. You know, especially in the wild, maybe in a zoo setting, but that's completely different as they're relevant to, to you know, big game hunting in South Africa. But, um, you know, I really relied a lot on um, the guide's knowledge of the animal. And, um, you know, my guide actually carried a booklet with him. And some of these species may only come to a watering hole or somewhere where you're going to be near in one of their hunting blinds once every three days. Hmm. So... You're not guaranteed to see one. They may never come in. You know, they may have came in the day before, and it could be another two days before you ever see one. Um, the Gims buck is a herd animal, and we actually left the ranch that we were on to get to another another area. And um, on that part of this, what they call concession, there was um, there was several Gims buck on this property. And so we kind of stuck around that for the last two days because of my eagerness to shoot one of these animals. And uh, and it really, it paid off for us. But like I said, it's a herd animal. And we got into a situation where there was about 15 um, gims bucks traveling together. And they're very fidgety animals. And we sat in a blind on the last day of my hunt. And I prayed and prayed that I was going to get a shot at one of these after they came in after several hours of sitting and not seeing one. Um, finally, this herd came in. It came in. It went. They left. They came back. I, I thought they were gone for good. I, my hopes, I thought, were shattered. But um, when they came back the second time and, you know, I got in position, um, there was only two bulls in this whole herd of 12. So there was only two males that I could shoot. Um, the one I ended up shooting was the smaller of the two. Um, but the reason being is it took me almost three hours to get a shot on just one of them because every time one would move, another would move behind it. Um, and it was just, it was really frustrating. I mean, it, it tested every, like every nerve that I had. I mean, I didn't even know that I had that kind of patience because I was up, I was down, I was ready to shoot. You know, I just couldn't get a good clean shot. And I'm, I'm really big on, you know, a clean kill. I don't want to take a shot that I'm not confident in. I don't want to wound an animal. And, um, at this time, you know, I knew, I knew the capability of the bow that I had. I'd already killed two animals with it previously on the trip before the gims buck, um, complete pass throughs on some of them. And I just, I wanted to make sure, you know, I had the, the perfect shot. And um, when it finally came down to it, it was literally three hours of me getting up and down, getting in position, trying to shoot through a very tiny window. And I was in a ground blind that's actually below ground, um, almost all the blinds in South Africa were like that. They're about three feet underground. Hmm. And I, to give you an example, I'm five foot one. <laughs> so the windows and all of the blinds were pretty tall. So I was actually standing on a seat <laughs> trying to shoot through this window. It made a little <laughs> bit more challenging for me. Gotcha. Maybe if I had been six three, I, maybe it wouldn't have taken them so long. I don't know. Who's to say? But it, it definitely it definitely offered some more challenge to to this hunt um, for me in this particular blind that we were in. 
um, but finally pulled it off. And I, I think I probably shed a tear or two. I was so happy because, it, like I said, it was the last day, last hunt. It was my last opportunity to shoot this gim buck, and I made it happen, and I couldn't have been any happier about it. It was just an amazing animal, such a such a beautiful animal. I can't wait to get it back here to see it again in person. How long does it take to get the animal back? Uh, they say on average it takes five to six months to get the animal back into the state and through customs and all the other checks that they have to do. Not enough also getting the hide stand and everything, the, the whole process that it goes through in order for it to be able to be shipped back here. Okay. So why do they put the ground blinds so deep into the earth? You know, that's a great question. Um, I want to say, and this is my experience, that some of it has to do with safety um, because there are animals in, you know, South Africa that are a little bit more aggressive than some of the animals that we're used to dealing with here. Um, but it also gives more coverage um, in terms of just blending into the environment because there's not a lot of trees there. You know, there's bushes, there's okay. smaller, you know, there's a lot of smaller, smaller trees. Um, you just, you really just don't have the coverage. A lot of the roofs were covered in mud, you know, and that could be too because it gets, so hot there yeah. and we were there in the winter time and you know it's their winter in, the, in our summer sure. here in the states but um when we were there winter is about 45 degrees in the morning all the way up to 80 degrees in the afternoon so i think you know from a comfort standpoint that probably has a lot to do with it too interesting that's not really a question i asked them specifically hey why are these built underground but hey i'll tell you one thing i felt a lot safer for in those underground blinds when, you know, we had some of these large Cape Buffalo and stuff come in to right. come into our set. Yeah. So. Yeah. When the black death steps into your set. Yeah. I'd like to be underground too. I, I get that. Sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, that's true. And, and still, it still gets you on edge. Absolutely. I would, that'd be crazy. So let's, let's talk about some of the correlations and similarities between hunting Africa and hunting Ohio for whitetail, can you draw a conclusion where it's it's a similar situation? Well, similarities um, between hunting Ohio and hunting in South Africa uh, definitely would have been playing the wind. You know, mm. um, which set you're going to choose to go sit in. You know, same here. You you may not want to go sit in one stand because of the wind direction, and you know that's a you know that's not a good spot for specific wounds. Um, same way there, their animals have a really great sense of smell. So you really do have to play the winds there too. And that may not play into rifle hunting so much, but on our particular trip to South Africa, we were bow hunting. So, you know, we really treated it very similar to the way we treat white bow hunting here as just playing the winds. And, you know, we sat in several different stands and, um, or blinds there. Um, so we kind of knew where we wanted to go the next day because they they did have a bow they had a bow hunting only area where we were at which was which was nice okay gotcha well it sounds like that was a heck of a trip um that's uh it's on my bullet my 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 uh bucket list and someday i will get over there i almost pulled the trigger this time and matt did ask me to go but couldn't couldn't quite put it all together but maybe maybe in the near future here Give me a dust. Hey, that would be awesome. Like we've talked about going back. It's you know, I highly recommend it. It was it was a blast. Um, even when we had a close encounter with a Cape Buffalo, you know, um running from one of those is probably the last thing that I want to do again. But um I'd still get back in the heartbeat. It was it was it was a good time. Right. Well let's come home and, and talk about one of your most memorable deer hunts, Steph. Can you take us back to a moment in time and kind of give us a play-by-play, step-by-step, you know, minute-by-minute type of thing? Um, and have I like to have Dusty kind of take us as as the tour guide. If you can think back to a moment in time, that might be your most memorable deer hunt. Are you um, ready for this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Where are we headed? So my most memorable deer hunt would have been, oh, November of 2013, 
um, I was two weeks out of a complete reconstructive surgery on my right foot. I had a metal plate, nine screws put in it. Um, it was something that kind of came out of nowhere. We'll say I didn't, wasn't prepared for it. it. Fell right in the hunting season just before what I had, I had my surgery on Halloween and I just remember being so upset about having to have the surgery leading into it. I I was a mess. I was crying every day. <laughs> I was so upset. I'm not going to get to hunt. I've only been in the stand. It rained that entire September, just every day, pouring rain. It was like every chance I could get to get in the woods. It was a horrible day. And then before I knew it, my surgery was there and I hadn't shot a deer yet. And I, I really was just a mess. And I remember calling my dad and dad, like, I'm not going to get to hunt this year. I'm going to be off my foot for the next two and a half months. I'm not even allowed to put my foot on the ground. You know, uh, this is awful. I, I just, I felt like my life was over. Because <laughs> that is what sounds it did to me. That's what it felt like. Um, You know, and he just said to me, you know, sis, don't worry about it. We'll we'll figure something out. You know, I'll we'll get you out in the woods. And um, he called me back about a week after my surgery and to talk about going out to the cabin in southeast Ohio and he had a plan and his plan was he was going to pick me up crutches and all here I can only put on one boot because my right foot was wrapped up like a soccer ball like you know he picked me up and he laughed about only taking one of my boots because I didn't need the other one and <laughs> um, he said you know they were gonna we're gonna get to the cabin he's like it'll be fine I'll put right. you in the ranger, we'll drive you, you know, down to this one area that I actually, it was one of my favorite spots to hunt. It was my brother's, my brother's blind. So anytime he was out of town, I could get him there. And he, uh, he happened to not be there that weekend. So it worked out. But my dad said, you know, I'll drive you out to this blind. You'll be able to get in that one and, you know, just get you situated in there. I'll get all your stuff in there, your bow and everything. And, um, and he did. He took care of me, you know, babied me. All all the guys at camp were great, you know. They they were very accommodating to my situation, um, being on crutches and all crippled up. And my doctor would have totally killed me if he knew what I was doing. But um, I didn't. I didn't let him know about my about my deer hunting adventure. Um, but he did. He got me out into the blind the first morning we were there, and a couple hours into it. Um, I had a I had a doe come in and about 25 yards and I got a got a shot on her and I was ecstatic. You know I I had a deer down. I didn't think I was even going to get to hunt this year. Great, right, you know. And um, I couldn't get out of the blind to get to the deer because I had to crawl <laughs> into the blind and I would have had to crawl That's back great. out and crawl 25 yards with crutches. And that just goes to show. That shows you the heart yeah. of a white tail hunter right here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, the the best part about it was, um, you know, finally my dad, you know, they come back to me about lunchtime. You know, we always set up time we're going to meet. He's going to come back. Okay, great. So he gets back. I'm ecstatic, you know. And so we get the deer. And the best part about it this time was I didn't have to do any of the work. I couldn't right. field dress the deer. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't stand up. I'm feeling like a princess here. And I'm like, wow, this is not one crutches more often. <laughs> no dragging, no <laughs> no having to feel dressed. It was nice. Um, but in all reality, you know, the guys were awesome. They were so ecstatic that I shot this deer on crutches with a bow. And, you know, that was that was fun for them. And then we go back for lunch a couple hours later, go back out for evening set. You know, he's like, do you want to go back out again? And I'm like, heck yeah, I'm going back out again. And, uh, nice. same thing, got me loaded back up in the ranger, went back out, um, been out there about 25 minutes or so. And, uh, had a, had a young, I'll, I'll say it was a younger seven point. He came, he came down into my set about the same spot the, the dude came into and, you know, it wasn't the biggest buck, um, I'd ever seen or wanted to shoot or anything like that but i knew that this was one of my last opportunities to shoot a deer because i know i'm not going back out again after this i've already slipped and fell probably eight times in between the first year and the second time i got back to this blind so <laughs> i'm done I'm, my doctor is going to kill me um, but i'm sitting there and that buck comes in and i mean i didn't even really hesitate it wasn't a matter of if it was the trophy or not 
It was just a matter of I'm feeling my freezer because this is my last opportunity. And I shot this buck and I finally get a hold of my dad, um, you know, let him know, hey, I shot another buck. He's like, are you serious? You just shot a deer like three hours ago. And here there's probably, oh, six guys at camp, um, maybe six to eight guys at our camp. And um, I had already shot two deer and. I don't think anyone else had shot a deer at this point, and I'm the only female there. So you can only imagine all the hell I caught once I came back. You know, they're they're getting shown up by a skirt and crutches and everything else. It was it was pretty funny. Um, they still laugh about it to this day. And, you know, we've had some some pretty good laughs over it, but it's always a competition between me and the guys. I think well more. Or competition for them to, you know, not look bad shooting against the female on stretches <laughs> with the bow. <laughs> but it was that was probably the most memorable hunt I had just because everybody was so awesome and it just helping me out and making sure that, you know, I got to do what I loved, you know, when I probably shouldn't have been doing that or it would have been very ill-advised by my doctor. I know that. All right, absolutely. But that's very cool that you was able to get out, even though you had a, a surgery, and and the, the guys catered to you a little bit and, and got you on some whitetails. That's a great story. Yeah. Was, great story yeah. stuff. It was, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely will never forget that. That's the crutch buck that I call. Um, yeah. Actually, to get, I'll be getting him back in about two weeks or so from the taxidermist. He still has him. Um, uh, just a, a family friend actually took that one. Did I wasn't going to get it mounted, but it just had so much sentimental value. And I actually kept the crutches that I had and they're wrapped in camo um, tape. I wrapped them up. You know, I wanted to be all camo. <laughs> <laughs> I spent some time doing that before the trip too, but I I'd like to hang that mount with the crutches somewhere, just you know, for that old sentimental purpose. Yeah, absolutely, that'd be cool. That's fantastic. So, Steph, what would the Steph Brown of today tell the Steph Brown of twenty years ago, knowing what you know today? Oh, oh my gosh, don't do that. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> just don't. Uh, just don't. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun in life, and, um, you know, I don't have any regrets. And everything that I've done in my past has made me the person I am today. And, you know, I grew up in a, you know, in a great family and have great friends and great people around me that support me. And, you know, I just I wouldn't be where I was. I wouldn't be where I was at if it wasn't for my past. So, sure. um, you know, I. I would just say, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be just fine. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. So, Steph, is there one of the, in your bag of goodies that you bring in the woods with you? And I have one of these. I think everybody kind of has like a good luck charm or something that you feel like you, you're kind of naked if you don't have it with you. Besides your firearm, what's that one thing you got to have in your pack to feel successful? Or maybe it's a pacifier. I don't know. But what's that one thing you got to have with you at all times when you're hunting? Oh my gosh. You know, I am a little superstitious and I have a favorite hat mm -hmm. and that hat, I think I almost cried once when I thought it was gone forever. And I ended up finding it wedged between a cushion and my couch. And I, I, I think I cried a little bit when I found it. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, it was the one thing that I always had to have with me that and my range finder, uh, you know, as far as an apparatus is concerned, but, uh, definitely my lucky hat. So it sounds crazy. The lucky but... hat. Uh, no, nope, that's not crazy at all. Everybody's got something. All right. So yeah. are you a reader, Steph? I do like to read. I like okay. to read magazine articles. I'm not a big book reader, but okay. I definitely like what's what's the what, what's the couple of magazines that you turn to frequently in order to to gather more knowledge about hunting? Well, I've always um I've always been a big reader of the Field and Stream magazine and I also read Bow Hunter magazine. Um, I've written some articles for Hunter's View magazine and, you know, a great group of ladies. And I also have an article that I have written about my South African hunting trip um, that's going to be in the November, December issue of Girls, Guns, and Rods magazine, which I really like supporting them and just women in the outdoors in general and seeing, you know, some of the stories that other women are sharing and that's encouraging more women to get involved in the outdoors. But, you know, any, really, any of those magazines, um, Turkey Callers of America, um, those are some of my go-to magazines I like to read. Um, either the stories or, you know, tips and tricks. I'm all about seeing what other people 
are doing and what's working for them and seeing if I can apply some of that to to what I'm doing, you know, if it's going to help me out. Um, same as I guess same as talking with other hunters, but those are some of the magazines that I that I really like to read. Gotcha. Very good. And if you could pick one hunting tip, what's your number one hunting tip of all time? Oh, man, that's a hard one. My number one hunting tip of all time. Yep. You have to be pick prepared. one. Be prepared. Okay. Be prepared. That's huge. And preparation, you know, and everything, making sure that you have all of your gear. That, that's really, that's huge. Um, you know, last thing you want to do is get to a stand with your bow and you forgot your bow release. I mean, <laughs> that's just something I've never done. Knock on wood. Don't intend to do it, but I like to make a mental checklist and then go through that, you know, checklist before I even... Um, exit the premises from wherever I'm at, wherever I'm going, I'm making sure that I have my essentials. And, you know, I, I've left my range finder a couple times and, uh, you know, I can get by because in most of the places I've hunted, I've already ranged, you know, a lot of the areas around me and I know what trees what. So, you know, not that big of a deal, but there are some things that if I left behind, I would, you know, be pretty upset that I had to turn around and go back and ruin a morning or an evening hunt for myself. Gotcha. Very good. So Steph, if, if uh, our listeners who are listening to the show want to contact you, if they want to, if they're a, a, a lady that wants to get into the hunting aspects, how would they reach out to you? Well, I have a Facebook page, um, that, you know, anyone can follow. It's facebook.com uh, forward slash Ohio Huntress and the number seven. And then I also have a blog page at um, www.wordpress.com forward slash Huntress seven. And there I've posted some product reviews, tips and tricks, um, and a lot of wild game recipes. I really enjoy um, cooking the wild game that I've taken. That's one of my passions. So that's where that's where people can find me. Awesome. Very good. Again, but I wanted to thank you for being on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. It's been an absolute honor and love the stories, love the detail you shared with us and uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, hopefully the next buck you shoot won't be on a crutch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, Dusty, for inviting me on the show. I felt honored to be a guest. And uh, maybe one day in the future, I'll have another story that can top the crutch buck story for you. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks to Steph Brown for joining us on the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, and then uh, thanks for tuning in to the show. Um, you know, I just can't thank you enough. We're, our downloads are tremendous right now. Of course, it's deer season, and that's kind of what we do here on the Big Buck Podcast. What's happening in Ohio, Dusty? You know, the, the rubs and the scrapes are really starting to progressively pick up and uh, start to see a lot of deer activity in the fields that have been harvested and, and deer on the move. You know, you drive around the evening time, there's deer out in the fields along the tree lines, and, and uh, I'm starting to see some activity. You know, the mature bucks are finally, finally starting to leave their bedding areas and, and travel around a little bit, and they're starting to learn the area, uh, you know, pretty much like starting all over. The rut's getting close, and uh, I think over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to see a lot of bucks hit the ground, Jay. That's cool. I'm kind of excited to see some more big pictures being sent in. We're certainly getting our fair share of bucks being sent into the Big Buck Podcast Facebook page. So if you'd like to show off your buck for a day or two and be famous in front of our 170,000 followers, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and all the instructions will be right there for you. Uh, what's, Dusty, happen, what's happening in the woods oh, in New Hampshire, Jay? Well, Dusty, I've, I've had a few encounters in the woods uh, recently this week. I actually hunted a different spot and I, I the way i picked this spot is it's a place i've hunted before but i i've got this new app i've been playing with that uh came recommended from a friend of mine who lives here in new hampshire but hunts illinois a lot and we, he likes to it's called uh it's called hunt stand actually and it's has to do with basically it's topographical maps and you know terrain maps satellite maps and you can place a stand of yours you know the 8 million that we have and you can look at wind direction and where your scent cone is going to be falling in each stand. So what I've been doing is picking the stands based off of the direction of the wind and which one would be more appropriate to hunt that night. 
as opposed to other ones where the, the deer are coming into your scent. So by doing so, I've actually had a little bit more luck than I think I normally would have. I'm seeing more deer simply because cool. I am picking the stands based off of wind direction. Right on. Yeah, that, uh, that plays a major role. It does. It's kind of neat. So I'm going to keep using that strategy until the, the woods get all stirred up with a bunch of hunters and, you know, all, all game is or all bets are off basically because they're, they're just moving around all over the place. But, Very cool. But I'm for excited. now. I'm excited to see what the next few weeks brings. I am too. I, uh, I'm very excited. It's just been a great season so far. I haven't actually taken a deer, but I'm getting close and I can feel it. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm like one or two seconds away from making it happen. So I'm just going to keep on it until it happens. Very cool. Yep. So do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week, Dusty? We do have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. You know, you travel around doing a little hunting in different states and, uh, you know, you, you you're not really educated on the area. So take take your friend's advice and, and, and give them the opportunity to teach you to, to to hunt that area and to learn how that area needs to be hunted to be successful. Great tip. Use your friends. Doesn't get any better than that. Just tap into that knowledge base. Yeah, just, uh, you know, the, the person that you're traveling to hunt with usually will know the area enough to educate you enough to be successful in the whitetail woods. Yep. Absolutely. Hey, I want to say, uh, give a special uh, belated birthday to Ed Waite, by the way. Yeah. Happy birthday, Ed Waite. Happy birthday, Ed Waite. Well, man, how can uh, how can we find you when you're not hanging out here with me on this microphone? You can uh, look me up at uh, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. You can also go to facebook.com forward slash chubby gobbler. And if uh, you'd like to shoot me an email, you can do that at dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. And uh, I do have an Instagram account. If you uh, want to reach out to me on Instagram, look up uh, at chasing antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Oh, the best place to contact me is by email. It's jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, as we had uh, mentioned before, and just to recap, you can always find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. If you'd like to show off your buck, uh, again, all you have to go is bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. All the instructions will be there for you at your disposal. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. And if you'd like this show, we could always use a hand. And if you'd like to pledge your support to keep this show up and running and pledge your support to help us pay the bills around here, we could certainly use some, uh, we could certainly use a hand, and that's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Well, man, I think that is a wrap. That's a big buck, big buck everywhere, a big buck. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Yeah.